Okay, so this is a joint work with uh, Patrick Schultz. And um, I think it's a testament to Topo's theory that it can contain both Alan Kahn's uh, talk and this talk in one <laughs> subject. So, um, so I'm going to be talking about a specific example, uh, namely the national airspace system. Uh, and then I'll be talking about a lot of Topo's theory that came into a project we did. So we did a project with NASA and the goals, so they, they have some, the US has something called the national airspace where all the airplanes are. And the goals of NextGen, which is the, uh, a NASA program, is they want to double the number of airplanes in the sky, but remain extremely safe. Okay? Because right now they have a problem about, about one in every billion hours of flight time, and they want to keep that billion. And, and the safe separation problem is that planes need to remain at a safe <coughs> distance from each other, uh, but they can't communicate directly. So they use <coughs> radars, pilots, ground control, radios, TCAS. These are all various systems behaving in various ways, trying to keep planes from getting too close. And the thing is that each of these is using a different kind of, uh, uh, of time-based behavior. So the airplane is satisfying a differential equation. The pilot might be just some kind of delay of what goes on, what he sees or she sees. Uh, <laughs> it turned, that's how they kind of think about it. Um, and uh, whereas the Collision avoidance system, the TCAS, oh, that's a word I'll be saying a few times, collision avoidance system, uh, sends the signals, move up, move down, move up. It just sends them whenever it needs to. So it's kind of uh, uh, just a signal as opposed to a differential equation. So we have a great variety of interconnected systems, and they need to work in concert to enforce a global property safety, safe separation. Um, and here's a little picture. You have two planes, plane one and plane two. Plane one sends plane two. I'm planning to move up. Plane 2 takes that information and also the radar signal and satisfies a differential equation which changes its altitude, which blah, blah, blah. And inside plane 1, you could zoom in and you would see that the onboard TCAS would take the other person, the other plane's TCAS command. It plans to move up. The radar signal says we're both at these altitudes. Sends a signal to the pilot who controls the throttle, et cetera, and uh, the altitude changes by differential equation, which then gets sent to the satellite, et cetera. So you could zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and each of these systems was made by a different uh, company, so they all, they're all, you don't know what's inside of any of these things. So I won't be saying company and collision too much. I'll be mainly talking about toposes. Uh, but uh, you can imagine that if you don't understand what this is doing, you just get some kind of guarantee, or you say, here's a jet. I hope it works for you. Uh, what are you going to do to know that you're going to achieve safe separation of this whole thing? So, in the end, everything in sight here will be assigned a sheaf. A sheaf of possible behaviors for each box, a sheaf of possible behaviors like what kind of signals each wire can carry, sheaf morphisms from the boxes to the wires, and uh, the whole thing, whoops, will be... Um, right, so a plane has an altitude behavior, a TCAS behavior, and we want to write all of this logically in the internal language of a topos, and ask uh, that if the boxes satisfy predicates, properties in this internal language, like I'm, an, I'm a jet, if you tell me to move up, I'll move up. Um, if everyone satisfies their own local property, then the whole system satisfies safe separation. So we want to prove something in the logic uh, of that sort. Um, so the question is, what's the topos we need for the national airspace system? That's where we started. That's where our project started. Um, and as I said, the only requirement is that I need to be able to understand differential equations or even differential inclusions means f of x dot is not equal to y, x dot is not equal to f of x, f dot is between f of x and f of x plus 5, right? So differential inclusions, uh, continuous dynamical systems, labeled transition systems, which means that, you know, you're moving around on a graph um, based on commands like move up, move down that can come at any moment in time. Delays, non-determinism, determinism. So we need a logic for this. And currently, the combination process takes place in engineer's head, but we need to do better for our next gen. Right now, if you want to sat sit figure something out about differential equations, you can. It's all mathematics. Or about labeled transition systems, you can. But if you want to put things together, you can't. So as I said, topos is, uh, the relationship is that toposes have this internal language and logic that uh, 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 Professor Bolso uh, talked to us about. And so we can use formal methods and proof assistance, for example. To, like, we can actually plug these things into COC and uh, prove properties of the national airspace. So the plan of the talk is that I'll 
talk, I'll define this topos B of behavior types. I'll discuss temporal type theory, which is a sound uh, fragment of the language of B, but it's enough to do all of the stuff I've been saying, and uh, return to this national airspace use case. Okay, so uh, I'm just putting these, I'm not gonna read these slides, these are just here so you know like something's progressed and we're actually making progress in this talk. Okay, so the topos B of behavior types. So we wanna model behavior. Okay, I'm behaving right now, I'm doing something, and so are you, and so is your thoughts, and so is your body. Um, so what, what are we talking about that behaves? All of these things behave, but so does an airplane, so does a radio, a movie is a kind of behavior for me. Uh, anything, if you see a fight, that's two fighters behaving and interacting, and we need to understand what that is. Um, so any sort of thing that can happen, I want to model with this system. So behavior type is like airplane behavior or pilot behavior. It's the set of things that an airplane can do, which is different than the set of things that the real numbers can do, say. The real numbers can just be five. A real number can just be five forever. Or maybe a real number can change in time, like our distance to the sun is a real number changing in time. So those are things that those can do, but a pilot is a different sort of thing that it can do. Um, so what are these behaviors? They're collections of possibilities, so you should think sheaves, indexed by time intervals. And I want, right, okay, I said it right there. So what, what the question then is what should we mean by time? And that's the topos, what to topos should we use? And the only rule that I have to, say, to guide this is that whatever we should mean, it should capture the kind of behaviors that we see in this national airspace example, because that's where we started. And the hope is that if it captures those, then it probably can do anything you can think of, maybe because this was given to us by random chance. It was just like the whole national airspace system. And it's not like we did all of it, but we did enough that we felt confident. So, oh, and it should do it compositionally, that if you can prove properties of individual systems, you can combine them. So the first guess you might have is, if what should time be? It should be R. So sheaves on the real line. And so the question is, does it serve as a good site? Um, so what would a behavior type on, what would that mean? What is, if we thought of sheaves on R as behavior types, what would they do? For every time interval, open interval, we would get a set of possible behaviors that can occur on that interval. That's how we would interpret B of the interval. Um, by the way, the open intervals are a basis for the, real for the topology on the real line, so it's enough to consider the site of open intervals. Um, on morphisms, if we had one open interval contained in another inter open interval, we would be able to restrict B behaviors to, you know, whatever, I'm do whatever I can do over an hour-long period, I you can restrict it to what I can possibly do over a five-minute period. So I want to break up the gluing conditions of the, real, uh, of the topology on the real line into two pieces. One I'm going to call continuity gluing, which says that the behaviors over an inter open interval AB, a say 0 to 5, is the limit of the in, uh, behaviors over the A prime, B prime that are strictly or way below A, B. So strict, strict inequalities on each side. So that says that there's some kind of continuity. Uh, and the other I want to talk about is composition, which says that the behaviors over an interval A, B is the product of those that can occur over A, B prime with A prime, B fibered over A prime, B prime. So that you can glue two intervals, right? You, you can do glue two behaviors. Uh, but there's two reasons not to use this sheaves on R as our topos. One is that we often, the most important is we often want to consider non-composable behaviors that don't satisfy composition gluing. So for example, what if I said, uh, your requirement is you must be roughly monotonic. I don't need you to be monotonic. That f of t, uh, that if t is less than t2, then f of t is less than f of t2. But instead, that you're just roughly monotonic. You're, if I check you on any interval bigger than 5, you've been monotonic. But um, so if t1 plus 5 is less than or equal to t2, then f of t1 is less than or equal to t2. This is a curve that's roughly monotonic. You check on any interval bigger than six, 5, and, and you'll find it's increasing. Another one that you can't even check locally at all, oh, but this does not satisfy the continuity gluing because something over an interval of length four could completely satisfy, and over another interval of length four, er everything satisfies, but when you glue them together over an interval of length one, it fails to satisfy. And similarly, don't move too much. If I'm tethered, if I have some kind of pivot foot or something, and I'm tethered to be always within five uh, meters of where I am at any other time, that's something you cannot check locally. 
So we don't want composition gluing because it doesn't allow you to look at longer intervals of time. It, it says uh, you, can, you can cover any interval by infinitesimally small intervals, or as close to that as you want. And the second reason not to use it is we want to compare behaviors across different time windows. So if I said, do what I do, but five seconds later, that's a delay. But uh, what does it mean to do the same thing as me at a different time? Sheaves on R sees absolutely no relationship between the behaviors over 0, 3 and the behaviors over 2, 5. Those are two completely different open sets that it assigns completely, possibly different uh, sets of uh, sections. So we want some sort of translation and variance, and, and those were the criteria we landed on. So we're going to replace R with an intervallic timeline, and we're going to quotient by a tr translation action. So by an intervallic timeline, I mean uh, IR, the interval domain, it's called. And the definition, if you like category theory, is it's a twisted arrow category of, of R with less than op. And the op, uh, you should, the reason you should, it's op is because you should think of these as points in the specialization order rather than as opens. So the points of IR, this topological space, which is Scott domain, if you know what that is, are closed intervals A less than or equal to B. That's going to be one object in this twisted arrow category. And we write that AB is less precise than A prime, B prime. We're imagining that real numbers are like the most precise closed intervals and that we're approximating that. And so uh, AB is less precise than A prime, B prime if indeed A prime, B prime is contained in AB. So the real numbers sit inside of the interval domain as the maximal points. Well, there's an op here. I'm talking about less precise. And yes, it's strange, but you're supposed to think of this as specialization order, not, um, not open sets. So IR is a Scott domain, which means that its post set of points determines a topology. That's not what a Scott domain is, but it does. And how, how so? Well, there are adjunctions. For any post set, you can look at the ideals in that post set, and you can take the down closure uh, functor. And that takes any uh, point here and looks at its ideal of points below it. And that sometimes has a left adjoint, which we'll call colim, and that means it, you would call that it has directed soups. Um, if colim itself has another left adjoint, you call that way below, and now you have a Scott domain. It says that every, um, every point in here has kind of a least covering, in some sense. A least ideal whose colimit is itself. So in this way below, AB is way below A prime B prime. If you work out what this left adjoint does, it says that um, an element is in, the, is in this ideal if, if there are strict inequalities on both sides. So if you remember, that's what I used for the, composition, for the continuity gluing. And so to Scott topology says take these as a basis of opens. Now up. Yeah, now it's up. <laughs> but it, it just means... Um, a prime, B prime is in the way up closure of AB if AB is in the way down closure of A prime, B prime. Uh, this is the way that you always define Scott domains. Um, so this is our timeline, this category here, this topological space. So we can represent, if you have a hard time imagining what this is, um, we can represent points and opens in IR in the upper half plane. So here's a point, here's AA, here's BB, here's AB. And how did I draw them? Uh, well, you take the interval, you take its center and its radius, and you plot at that point. So the upper half plane, this point here rep represents this entire interval from AA to BB. And the open, the open set, up arrow, double up arrow AB, is all the stuff in this gray. So that's, that's a basic open set there. We take the entire upper half plane and we take these as our basic open sets. And that is the topology. So what do you get if you look at all open sets? Well, they're arbitrary unions of these. And in fact, they have a nice characterization in terms of Lipschitz functions. So if you take these as your basis, what can you possibly get as unions of these? You get all of the one Lipschitz functions from the reals to the, to the po positive reals plus infinity. So what am I talking about? Suppose I have a one Lipschitz curve you could imagine it as unions of lots of these things here, because these are one Lipschitz, and any union of them will be one Lipschitz. So here's a, what, what open sets are in this, or what points are in this? 
all of the uh, points in the upper half plane, which represent intervals um, that are under this curve. Right, so for any topos of sheaves on a topological space, the open sets are eventually your truth value. So this will be a truth value for a proposition. I'll make more sense of that later, um, or maybe soon. So what, do you, what is a sheaf on IR? It's a behavior type occurring in the context of time, and I'll make that precise soon. But um, IR is our timeline, and X of AB is a set of, AB, of X behaviors that can occur over the interval AB. So we can restrict behaviors to subintervals. Um, yeah. Okay, so the truth values are Scott open sets. So if you take the area under any one Lipschitz function, it's a Scott open. And the truth of any proposition, in, in general, in topos theory, if, you, if, you're not, uh, if you're new to the subject, when instead of asking, is a behavior roughly monotonic or is something true, you always ask, when is it true or where is it true? because your result is a, is a value in, the, in omega, in this um, sub-object classifier. And so for us, when we say, when is a behavior satisfying rough monotonicity, we're asking over what intervals is the behavior roughly monotonic. Maybe we want, it, we want it to be roughly monotonic over all intervals, but we get some answer that says one of these Lipschitz functions as our answer. It was roughly monotonic throughout this, point, this area. Okay, so sheaves on IR will be behavior types in the context of time. But now we want to keep durations, but remove the fixed timeline. All right, so we want, in order to compare behaviors over different timelines, we need some kind of translation action. So the reals act on IR by, for any real and any interval, you can add the real to the interval. That's pretty straightforward. So this induces a left exact comonad on sheaves on IR. And in, in case you think that's like some, uh, I mean, that's why am I saying that? Any surjection of uh, toposes, what's called a geometric surjection, comes with a left exact comonad. So those are the same thing. Um, in other words, we are, able to we are able to quotient by this action. So what is this monad? T of x, if x is a behavior type, it understands what you mean by behaviors over any given interval. And so if you ask, what can Tx do over the interval a, b? Well, it can do the product, give me any real number, and I'll tell you what x could have done over some shift of that interval. And so when you have a left exact comonad, you look at the co-algebras, and that, in fact, is the um, topos, uh, the quotient topos. So that's what we mean by B, that the topos of behavior types is this quotient. And in fact, B is an étendue, if you know what that is. If you don't, I'll tell you. Uh, it means that there's an inhabited object, which we're going to call time, and there's an equivalence between sheaves on IR and B sli sliced over time. So we can, we have sheaves on IR, I said was behavior types in the context of time. And in the internal logic, what it means to be, this to be, be sliced over time is that this, you know, sheaves on IR will be everything you can say in that internal language when you have a time variable in context. Okay, so next I want to give a site presentation of this topos, because right now it's this topos of co-algebras, which might sound uh, kind of abstract, but the site presentation is pretty easy, and in fact it's one that um, Levere also studied. No, he studied the same category, but a different site. So um, now take the twisted arrow category of the non-negative reals as a monoid, so that's a category with one object, and the twisted arrow category of it will have as objects real numbers, non-negative real numbers, and a map from one non-negative real number to another is a placement of the first inside the second as a subinterval. So that's just the twisted arrow category. It just says I have some R and S that when I add using the monoid to L prime, I get L. And that two there is not to the power two, sorry. That is the footnote that uh, Levere also studied sheaves on IR on the same uh, category here. Um, and he was also interested in dynamical systems but he used exactly the opposite sort of gluing we do. So whereas we're using this continuity gluing to ensure a kind of continuity that a behavior over some interval is completely determined by the tiny, you know, the infinitesimally smaller intervals inside of it, he said that he wanted uh, behaviors to compose so that um, you have a behavior, it stops at a certain point, and then if you resume at exactly the same state, uh, you can glue them. Anyway, so 
IR mod triangle is a continuous category in the sense of Johnstone and Joyal. They have a paper called Continuous Categories that uh, generalize Scott domains outside of post sets. And that, left ex that double left adjoint thing I said before is exactly what you do in, in for a continuous category in, in general. That's the definition. So um, there's a coverage uh, that they tell you in, the, in their paper um, which just says that the, th the intervals way below L cover L. So if you want to cover L, you just need things that are uh, strictly less on both sides. Of course, if, you, if things strictly less on both sides cover, then string things that are less than or equal to on either side or even equal cover, but you don't need those for your minimal coverage. So Johnstone, instead of talking about Joyal, uh, instead of talking about um, growth and topologies, um, he talked about coverages, or at least that's where I learned about coverages, was from Johnstone. And there it's much less, many fewer requirements on what you need to set up a site. And for us, the only thing you need to set up this site, the only coverage you need, are these way below um, covers. So a sheaf here, I'm t we're going to be talking about this topos a lot. So this entire talk is about this topos. And uh, it's sheaves on IR, mod triangle, so this translation invariant topos. And uh, it assigns a set of possible behaviors to each length. So what can I do over the course of an hour? What's the set of things I could possibly do? I'm not, you know, I, I, that's what I am as a behavior type, say. Um, when, when you take something I'm able to do over the course of an hour and you restrict it to a 10 second period, you can see what I'm able to do over the 10 second period and you get a map. And ec yeah, and we get this limit. So by the way, etendu means extent. Uh, and indeed, you can think of these instead of being uh, intervals embedded in a timeline, they're extents of time. So it's a nice word. Uh, say again? It's a limit, it's a sheaf. So wh what does this mean? It means that the set of things that are possible over an interval of length L, so the, the set assigned to this zero L is the limit of those, uh, it restricts to anything smaller, and it's the limit of all of the, B, uh, of X applied to all of the open intervals uh, that are strictly smaller on both sides, strictly interior on both sides. Okay, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's nice that the word extents actually really works in this case. Right, so the, the claim is that any sort of behavior can be modeled as an object here. Um, any sort of behavior that happens in time. You can ask me later if you have an idea of one that can't. I would be interested, but if we have time as we normally conceive of it, um, it, should be a, it should be a sort of behavior in this sense. So trajectories through a vector field, like this, you have some vector field. Uh, these would be the sections. So you'd say, over the course of a six second period, this is the set of things I can do. Um, delays and delay differential equations. You have some graph and you want to walk through it uh, and that s at random times you're just, maybe you're allowed to take up to two seconds per arrow to traverse this graph, uh, or you're, you have to do each arrow in, uh, instantly or whatever. You make any decision you want, you'll get a sheaf on, on this thing. Um, and the sub-object classifier is these one Lipschitz functions, just like before, because a, a locale, sorry, a, an etendue is locally a locale, which means that the sub-object classifier basically has very much the same flavor as the original uh, one. So what we want to do is have a logic to define other interesting behaviors besides these. Um, and logical expressions, so people have kind of uh, um, sung the praises of the intern internal logic, and I, I agree. Um, they're an amazingly convenient representation of things. So if I want to say, whenever I touch blue on this graph, um, I will remain on a blue edge for at least five seconds. I can say for all t colon time, and I'll describe this symbol later, if at t equals zero, uh, I'm at blue, then there exists a real number between zero and five such that between r and r plus one, I'm also on blue. So what's good about that? First of all, we have these kripke joyal semantics which allow us to, which I don't know if anyone's talked about in their course, but implicitly they did. We can take these um, logical expressions and just kind of uh, compile them down into, into statements about the sheaf topos, and I'll talk about that soon. So this says, if you give me a map from x to omega, like what it means for me to be blue, 
then I can give you a map from x to omega, namely this one here. So, and, and of course, if I have a map from x to omega, then I get the subtype of good behavior according to p. All of the behaviors on that graph that satisfy this. So I said the internal logic is convenient. First of all, this is a very compact notation. In a second, I'll, I'll go through the joyal kripke semantics in a, in a little more detail. Um, but this is a very compact notation for something much more detailed. Second of all, uh, this has precise semantics, so it means an, a, a one exact thing about a sheaf topos, or about maybe a map from x to omega. It's quite expressive, and it's readable in natural language. As you said, I mean, I can actually say for all time t, if at time equals zero, I'm blue, then there exists, you can read it. Um, and that's something that can be useful for people outside of topos theory. So they can actually use topos theory without knowing it if they have access to an internal language. Okay, so, by temp so let's talk about temporal type theory and the internal language of a topos. So it does a lot of heavy lifting for you, this internal language. Here's the kripke joyal semantics. Whenever you see a for all x, p of x, you can think for all opens u and all sections x in that open, p restricted to u holds. Whenever you see exists x, it says there is an open cover and a section in each one such that p holds on that open cover, on each element of that open cover. p implies q when you, that one always means for all opens u. Uh, if p of u holds and q of u holds, p, of or q, p or q means there exists an open cover such that on each open piece, um, p of u or q of u holds, etc. So everything you saw in this, um, in this guy here, of which a lot of those are showing up. You can't see them because they're hidden behind the modality I'll define later. Uh, these are each saying a lot of, you know, a lot of things about open covers and about restrictions, et cetera. By the way, in B, all of the covers are filtered, so or degenerates. Um, I haven't seen this written down anywhere, but if, if you've got a site where your covers are filtered, then or degenerates, which means you don't have to pick an open cover. You can actually just check it uh, on the whole open you're on. Okay, so for example, in any sheaf topos, you can use logic to define various Dedekind numeric objects. People often talk about the reals. Um, but I, I need other numeric objects besides the reals that are all of the same flavor. So when you start, in, in any sheaf topos, there's a, a sheaf Q. It's just the constant sheaf, which means locally constant sheaf. Um, um, over any open set, it assigns a set Q or a product of Qs, depending on number of components of your open set. So now what we do for Dedekind cuts, what Dedekind uh, invented, I guess, is that a Dedekind cut is a subset of rationals. And I want to think of delta as down, uh, the lower bounds for some real number. So for any Q, I give you the set of, I can tell you, yes, that's a lower bound, or no, that's not a lower bound. But instead, uh, omega, you shouldn't think yes, no. You should think where is Q a lower bound? When is this rational a lower bound? Anyway, so now we define these lower reals, uh, which in any topological space, when you look at what this, well, I think I'll get there in a second. Um, so the set of lower reals are the set of functions where there exists a lower bound, and for any lower bound, there is a slightly bigger lower bound. And if something's lower bound, then anything smaller is a lower bound for your real number. So this is what Dedekind wrote down. Um, and what I was about to say before is that the semantics are always nice on localic toposes. So suppose X is a topological space, then uh, this, the lower reals, as defined here, logically, this is completely logically, you use those Joyal set Kripke semantics, you compile it into sheaf, uh, into properties of a sheaf, and you find that that's exactly the sheaf of lower semi-continuous functions on, on, your, uh, on your topological space. So these kinds of things really give you confidence, or give me confidence, but it gives a lot of people who work with it confidence that if you write, if you write something down in the internal language, it will do what you want. Now, the, 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 the caveat is someone also said it's extremely sensitive. So for example, don't replace exists with not for all not, or something like that. You change something small, you may wonder which of these two is the one I really mean. Um, but you get to say what you really mean, and it will it will compile to something that you really mean. <laughs> well, what you, yeah. So anyway, so we will define the upper reals in exactly the same way, it's just that the 
less than will be reversed. Um, these will be upper semi-continuous functions. I'll define reals with a hat or a, a bar on the top and bottom to be a product. So these are just a pair of upper and lower bounds. These are called the extended intervals. And I'm calling all of these Dedekind numeric objects. They're some sort of numeric objects in the, se in the spirit of Dedekind. The real numbers in, in the topos are a pair, uh, are a, um, an extended interval, so an upper and a lower cut, that are disjoint and that um, are what's called located. If you have any two rational numbers, one's the lower bound or the other one's an upper bound. Omega, omega sorry, omega is the sub-object classifier of the topos. So by temporal type theory, I mean a finitely presented sublanguage of B's internal language. So the internal language of B is infinite. It has every object, it includes every object, every morphism is a term, every commutative diagram can, is represented as a fact in that internal language. Every finite limit, every exponential object, all of that is known to the internal language in some sense. But if we want non-topo theorists to use this, now I'm back to the example. I, I hope you haven't gotten used to the math. So now we're back in this example, and we'll return to it later again. So if NASA, NASA uses formal methods to prove properties of systems, if we want them to use something like this, we can't expect them to learn topos theory. We want to give them something they can just use out of the box. So we want to give them a finitely presented language. Um, oh, right. They, they write down formals in something called temporal logic, and I'll briefly compare temporal logic, linear temporal logic to this theory here. Anyway, they write down these formulas and proofs and they really care about them. I mean, they, they spend a lot of money on that um, and a lot of time and they hire smart people. And uh, we want to do the same thing, but we want a richer type system and what I would consider better semantics. So we present this finite sublanguage and then we build what we need from within. And that's this finite sublanguage or finitely presented sublanguage is what I'm calling temporal type theory. So the finitely presented language has one atomic predicate symbol that I am calling unit speed. It's a sub object of these extended reals. And once you have that thing called unit speed, um, we'll define time to be the set of extended intervals that satisfy unit speed. Because what unit speed is trying to do, so externally we have these intervals. And I just want time to be of the same nature as those intervals, to be traveling at unit speed with respect to the external intervals. And so time as a sheaf, I've already told you what it is. It's this sheaf that makes the etan do, uh, um, that defines the etan do. And, uh, but internally it's gonna be the set of, it's gonna be the sub-object classified by unit speed. So the idea is that a clock behavior over an interval of five seconds, if I check it, it's doing interval behavior. It's an interval over any interval of time. And that interval is moving along at unit speed with respect to perfect clock. So that's kind of the, the uh, intuition. Anyway, so this theory here, uh, this, the language has one atomic predicate symbol and that's it. From there we have defined time and then we have 10 axioms in the theory. And that one of them, for example, says that time is an R torsor. So for all time, for all reals, you can add, I can take my clock and add five seconds to it and I'll get a new clock. Or I can take two clocks, you know, uh, Doc's clock and Einstein's clock, if you ever watch the movie Back to the Future, and you look at them and they're always differentiated by exactly one minute, maybe, or something like that. So uh, for any two times, there exists a unique real number such that time one plus that real number is time two. And what do I mean by plus here? Well, the, the, this um, object of extended intervals comes with its own notion of plus that comes from Q. So I'm defining everything in terms of this internal logic, just things I can define internally once I have given myself one atomic predicate symbol. And then we check that these ten, 10 axioms are sound in B. So we already had this sheaf and we check that the interpretation, that with this interpretation, the 10 axioms hold when you use the kripke joyal semantics to write down what they mean. Um, by the way, there are many other temporal logics like metric temporal logic or linear temporal logic. They involve modalities like until and since, if you're interested in this. Um, there is completeness results like Camp's theorem that helps us turn this into something we can compare to. So this until and since logic is equivalent with what's called first order monadic logic of order, 
FO less than. And um, monadic here does not mean monad. It means that there's one type. It doesn't mean monad in the sense of category theory. There's exactly one type for their logic. And every predicate symbol has, is unary in a linear temporal logic. And time has an order, so there's this less than. And so you can write things like for all t, p of t implies there exists t prime bigger than t such a q of t. So it has very restrictive um, uh, rules on the si sorts of expressions you can write. That's linear temporal logic, and this is used around the world. This is an extremely important um, part of uh, engineering and science. So temporal type theory is pretty different. Namely, it's a type theory, so it's not just a logic. We actually have many different types, the behaviors of many different things. These are all the sheaves in our topos. And we also have, um, or maybe it's not all the sheaves, but it's all the ones we presented ourselves with, and we can always add to the, to the language if we want to. We have a higher order logic with no restrictions on the number of variables in a predicate symbol. Um, and so we can actually extend uh, the first order monadic la logic of order into our language. We just double negate everything and consider all the t variables as time. And then everything that's sound for them will be sound for us. So any proof you can write in linear temporal logic, you can import directly into temporal type theory. And that's good because temporal type theory is better in the sense that it's much more expressive, but it's worse in the sense that it's much less automatable. It's completely undecidable. You cannot decide whether an expression in temporal type theory is true. You can just try to prove it. Um, whereas temp uh, linear temporal logic, not only is it decidable, but they have things called proof checkers that will, will you give it a temporal logic expression, and it will either prove it or find a counterexample. Now, it does it in doubly exponential time, so, uh, uh, you can't give it anything very complex, but still they use this a lot and we can import any proof they give us into temporal type theory. So at least um, we need, these toposes are so big uh, and so you know, heavy in some sense that you need to come into them from different angles. I guess this is a lot of the, the bridge idea also. So if we can get a proof from linear temporal logic, we're def definitely gonna use it. Um, if we can get a, a proof from differential equations, we're definitely going to use it because temporal type, finding that proof ourselves would be much harder in just this internal language. So there are a number of useful modalities, also called levier turney topologies or Groland topologies, kind of, or um, local operators. Um, so modality, I call them modalities because that's what they call them in, um, in logic. So these are internal monads on the sub-object classifier. And if you were figure out what that means, it's that, first of all, it's a monad and, and, and it satisfies this condition or a monotonicity condition is equivalent. So P implies JP, JJP implies JP, and J of P and Q, if and only if J of P and J of Q. I think um, uh, Professor Borsu wrote that on the board. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between modalities, things you can write, uh, things of this form, and subtoposes of your original topos. That's pretty, to me, pretty incredible. Um, so here are example, two examples of, of, of modalities in the context of time. Two different maps from omega to omega with a lot of decoration, and I apologize for that. So this down arrow, T, A, B, says that in the context of time, I can say that either P is true or the time is kind of bigger than A or less than B. And similarly, at A, B will mean P implies that same thing implies that same thing. And if that looks weird to you, then um, you haven't uh, maybe studied too much of the internal logic of toposes because these are actually pretty common things to do. This is called the closed modality with respect to this weird expression here, and this one's called the quasi-closed modality with respect to this one here. Um, so they're hard to read, but they correspond to useful subtoposes. This at corresponds to the single point subtopos of one interval inside of, uh, of IR. So these are in the context of time. So they're occurring in IR. Um, this guy refers to the down closure, the closed set containing IR, uh, containing AB. And in the em empty context with no variables, we can write down something I call pi for pointwise. Um, P is pointwise true if for all time at that exact point when that clock strikes zero for all settings of the clock, P is true. And this corresponds to, a, they always correspond to a subtopos. This one corresponds to the subtopos 
of equivariant uh, sheaves on, on the reels inside of, of those inside of IR. So these are kind of the real, this is kind of the real line sitting inside of IR. And so now we can use these modalities to define local Dedek and numeric types. Because people often talk about the real numbers in a topos, but you can actually look at the real numbers inside of any subtopos of your topos and you get some kind of object that's worth considering a lot of times. So for any J, we can define the lower reals with respect to J, or the upper reals, or the reals. J logic, what I mean by that is you replace all your connectives and quantifiers with J counterparts. And what's the J counterpart for or, or and, et cetera? Well, every connective com satisfies some kind of universal property. And is a meet, or is a join. And if you, instead of asking for that universal property to hold for all propositions, you just ask it to hold for J closed propositions, then you can check what quantifier or what sort of uh, uh, combinator or whatever you can use to, to get that universal property. So you want to reflect the, the logic of the subtopos into B. Whatever B j sub J thinks is true, I want B to know about it. So we're going to define J logical versions of all the Dedek and numeric types. So for example, the reals, uh, the lower reals of type J, instead of map from Q into the um, omega, the subobject classifier, it goes into the closed propositions. And instead of exists, there's J exists. But the and, I don't need to worry about it because J of and, J and and commute. So for ver you can kind of check for each logical connective and for each quantifier what you need to do to get the J logic. And for all, you don't need to do anything. It kind of just automatically happens because delta is J closed that for all Q, delta Q satisfies the universal property, but exists, needs this J on the outside. Um, right, so when J is the identity uh, uh, modality, you just get lower semi-continuous functions on IR. When J is the pi modality, you get the lower semi-continuous functions on the reals embedded in IR. When J is this at thing, you get the lower semi-continuous functions on a point, which are just the real numbers. So I can look at real numbers located at a point over the whole subtopos of the real line embedded in my upper half plane or the real numbers on the whole half plane. And from here, we're equipped to define derivatives of a real number or a varying real number, a real number in the context of time. So um, the semantics of x inside of r pi Sorry, D these are just continuous functions on po of point-wise time. So the distance from the Earth to the Sun is changing, and that change is happening through time, and that's an example of such an X. And so uh, if you look at the semantics of this, it's exactly the real valued functions on the real line. The normal thing that you think of when you're in calculus class, you draw a function on the real line of parabola, that's the semantics of this guy here, r pi. So evaluation of a point is just applying the modality at r to x. And now I'll get a point, I'll get a real number at a point, and I'm going to denote this x superscript at r. So you define the derivative for any real interval valued function. Uh, I said continuous, but you can think of this as continuous as you want, if you want, or more generally, for any interval valued function, I'm going to define the derivative of it. And the result will be another interval valued function, namely um, satisfying this formula that the derivative is between two bounds, if and only if, for all reals, this is all internal to the language. For all reals, um, Q1 is less than some rational, which is less than the slope of the secant line, which is less than Q. So the nice thing is that this looks exactly like the expression for the derivative in calculus class. I mean, they don't write it in this way because, um, for various reasons, but it's very familiar, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's the right, <laughs> it's, um, it's not too surprising that it would look like this. And so the theorem is that this is, that x dot is internally, oh sorry, derivative with respect to time in this sense is internally linear in x. So I can prove that it's linear in x. If I take two different values here, I can add them and get another one and the derivative will respect that. And this derivative satisfies the Leibniz rule. And second of all, that externally, when you look at the semantics, it's the semantics of the derivative of x. And the caveat only is that x dot externally is defined, internally is defined for any continuous function, even if it's not differentiable. So if you have any continuous function or even interval valued continuous function, x dot makes sense and is an interval. So what interval is it? 
Well, when x is externally differentiable, then semantically x dot really does give its derivative. And when it's not, x dot is an interval valued, very reasonable notion. Um, let's see if I can write it. Uh, so you might ask, what's the derivative of the absolute value? Uh, x equals absolute value of t. Well, x dot is an interval valued function that goes like this. So it's negative one, it's the interval negative one, negative one here. It's the interval one, one here. And at this exact point, it's the interval negative one, one. And this definition of derivative works. Um, in fact, you can define it in analysis also. I think it's new, but I don't know for sure. Um, but it's very easy to define. And uh, I think it's a better notion because that, that's, uh, or I, at least I like it. Because every interval valued function, even this one here, is differentiable. That's differentiable. The result is zero for all time and then infinitely long interval at zero and then zero. So um, every interval valued function is differentiable and it gives you an interval valued function. You don't need to worry about differentiability. Any continuous, sorry, any continuous function is differentiable. Yeah. The which one? Yeah. Yes. Say again. Dindy derivatives. Okay, I need to look that up. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's probably right, yeah. Okay, so probably not new. Uh, it's probably the Dindy derivative. But you're right, just a lin, 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 lin soup on either side. But the point is that that always gives you some kind of reasonable notion of derivative. Um, so as a logical expression, derivatives work like anything else. So if you have a differential equation like this, these x dot, x double dot, you could put time in here, whatever you want. These are, this is now just a function, this is just an equation in the internal logic of a topos. x dot is defined internally to the topos, and if f is some function, uh, so is this thing. So a differential equation is not an external object anymore. Here, maybe a and b are continuous value functions of time, like what the pilot's doing to the thruster or whatever. So this is just an equation in the logic. We can use it with and, or, not, exists, for all, et cetera. You, you can combine it with any other property. And um, so now we've kind of internalized a lot of what we need. I haven't told you how to internalize label transition systems, but it's, you can internalize them without needing to kind of import them. So uh, to the safe separation problem is, uh, is kind of annoying. Um, basically, if I say I'm going to go down and you say you're going to go down, then we need to both like renegotiate, et cetera. So instead of we safe separation for a pair of planes uh, where you have radars, pilots, thrusters, actuators, discrete signals, differential equations, and delays, I'm just going to talk about safe altitude for one plane. I just want to get safe. And I have uh, um, one radar, one pilot, and one thruster, but I still use, the point is, I'm still going to use discrete, continuous, and delay uh, to, to check something. So the goal is to, to combine disparate guarantees to prove this useful result. And you know, here's all the things we used. So you have time, you have an altitude, you have a TCAS saying to go up or go down, occurring at discrete instance. You have the pilot do telling the plane what to do. You have a notion of safe margin, safe uh, altitude, a margin of error, a rational number that's the delay that the pilot is acting as. Um, and you have a maximal ascent rate for your plane. And you write down just some axioms. So this plane satisfies a property that, or these satisfy that the margin of error is greater than zero. The altitude of the plane is always non-negative. If, um, <laughs> if the altitude is bigger than safe plus margin, then the TCAS is saying to go up. And if A is less than that safe plus margin, the TCAS is saying climb. And um, if the pilot is saying, level, then the derivative is equal to zero, and if the pilot is saying climb, then the derivative is equal to the rate. And finally, that um, some longer logical condition, but easily writable in what I've already told you, uh, that the pilot is just a delay of the TCAS. And from there, you can prove this safe separation, which says that um, for all time, if you start your stopwatch at zero, you can interpret it that way, then when the time is bigger than delay plus safe over rate, then the altitude is safe. So we use these differential equations to prove this. It's not difficult. Um, so that's about it. I just want to conclude 
So the idea is that we can use topos theory to integrate systems in a kind of big tent framework. By big tent, I mean things that can understand what you mean by differential equations, delays. Um, the, that TCAS thing was a labeled transition system. Um, we say what occurs over time intervals and how they restrict. Um, and this topos has an internal native logic, in native internal logic that we take a small part of. And this logic looks just like set theory, but y you prove things just like you're proving things in set theory, um, except you have, uh, of course, you don't have the law of excluded middle, as everyone says, and you don't need it. And you have a built-in time object, so you can do temporal logic. And as I said, you get internal definition of ODEs, hybrid systems, et cetera, and pro prove these properties. And it's fully compositional because if you know something about this guy, this guy, and this guy, uh, each one of these is some behavior type, and you have some maps to the, to the wires, you can take a big and and, and get um, prove that your whole system satisfies safe separation. So there's a book that's going to be published by Springer called Temporal Type Theory. You can get it if you want. There are some technical parts, some friendly parts. The friendly parts are the, the, um, the examples and the... Um, Introduction to type theory, which uh, is just kind of very general, and to modalities. So I, I hopefully that part is readable. Um, and there's another book, if you're interested, called Seven Sketches in Compositionality, which I wrote with Brendan Fong in the back there. And that one also has chapter seven is about this kind of material. That book is just a friendly introduction. I know uh, one person here is using it as kind of nighttime reading just to <laughs> to uh, fall asleep in there. <laughs> um, so that's much more friendly if you're interested. So uh, that's it. Thanks.